Let's pray, shall we? Lord Jesus, we love you this evening. We thank you for the glory of the new creation, that if any man or woman is in Christ, they're a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. I do pray, Father, that as we look at your word this evening and tomorrow morning, that you would enliven to us the glory of the new creation, not just so we can have information in our head, Father, although that's part of it, but God, so that we can live and move forward in the glory and the fullness and the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord, in a dying, in the midst of a dying world. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> Praise God. I was talking earlier with John and a few of the guys, and uh, we were talking about how it's really important to know who you are, your identity. Your identity, the way you see yourself, is going to affect everything you do. If you think that you're a piece of rubbish, you're going to live like that. If you realize that you're loved by God, you're going to live like that. But being much more specific, if you're a Christian and you understand what it is to be a new creation in Christ, then you're going to live in the light and in the love and in the power and in the glory of the Holy Spirit. So it's really worth taking time to look at identity, who we are, what does it mean to be a new creation? But we're so used in our modern day, in our culture, to begin everything with ourselves. We're the reference point. So if we want to, say, discover something about what it is to be a Christian, a new creation, we start thinking immediately about what that, what that means about us. But it's actually the wrong place to start. The place to start is looking at Jesus Christ himself. He's at the center of what new creation is. That's what we're going to do this evening. We're going to take a look at Jesus. Take a look at Jesus. So if you would turn first, and we're going to go through a lot of scriptures tonight. So if you don't find you can keep up, don't worry. I'll be reading them out. Um, but if you can, make a note of them to look at later. We're going to start tonight in 2 Corinthians chapter 14. Sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Second Corinthians 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. I read that again. The love of Christ controls us. Because we've concluded this, that one, one has died for all. Jesus has died for everyone. Therefore, all have died. In Jesus, everyone, in that sense, died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. So if you're a believer tonight, you know that Jesus died for you, that he was raised on your behalf, your old nature is dead in Christ and you're alive as a new person in Christ. And why did he do this? The answer is given so that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised, that we would no longer live for ourselves. Who are you living for this evening when it really boils down to it? Because he died and he was raised for you so that you could live, not for yourself, but for him who died and was raised for you. Our culture, again, the message of our times is, it's all about you. Live for yourself. Get what you can out of life. The message of the gospel is the opposite. Jesus has done this for you. So you can be set free from the prison of living for yourself and so that you can live for the one who died for you. There was a British missionary um, many, many years ago called C.T. Studd. He was a cricketer. I think he was the England cricket captain. And he left all that to go and be a missionary in Africa. And he made this statement. He said, if Jesus Christ is God and died for me, then no sacrifice is too great for me to make for him. If Jesus Christ is God and he died for me, no sacrifice is too great for me to make for him. 
we're called as new creations in Christ to no longer live for ourselves, but for him. We're going to come back to that point at the end, because what I want to do now, as I said, is take a good, long look at Jesus. If you could turn to Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Colossians 1, 27. Paul is speaking here about a mystery that has been hidden for a long time. And he's saying that God has now actually revealed this mystery to his people, to the believers, to the saints. And he goes on to say what this mystery is. And this is in verse 27 of Colossians 1. To the believers, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So he's saying that the mystery that he's making known, that God is making known now, the mystery is rich, it's glorious. There's a heavy weight of glory to it. And this mystery is Christ in you. Christ, the Son of God, living in you. That's the mystery. And it's among the Gentiles. Christ is living in you amongst the nations. Okay? Christ in you, the hope of glory. We're going to look this evening at Christ, the Christ that's in you. What we're going to do as we focus on Christ is look at several aspects of who he is and then who you are because of him. We're going to start with 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. 1 Corinthians 1, 30. And because of God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Okay, because of God, not only is Christ in you, but you're in Christ. And Christ has become to you, to us, his church, wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Christ has become those things to us because Christ is those things. Let's start with righteousness. Christ is the righteous one. Righteousness means God's goodness, God's moral perfectness. And he's the righteous one. Romans 10 verse 4 says that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So the law says these are God's demands. This is what God requires of you as a human being, of every human being. And we're told there by Paul that Christ is the end of the law. He's fulfilled it. He is the fulfillment of all of God's demands that he would ever place on mankind. They're met in Jesus. So Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So for everyone who believes, they're given that gift of righteousness, of God's own goodness. The law is satisfied by Jesus. All of God's demands that he could ever place on you satisfied in Jesus. Jesus, the righteous one, you are given Jesus as a gift. And Jesus is God's own goodness given to you. He is our righteousness. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 21 says that God made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I read it exactly as it's written. For our sake, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So again, God took Jesus. He placed all the sin of the world on him. It was put to death in him. Jesus rose from the dead, the righteousness of God, 
so that you and I could become the righteousness of God through Jesus. Jesus is the righteous one and he's your righteousness. If you're looking for any kind of goodness or moral perfection in yourself, if you're thinking I somehow must meet up to the requirements and the demands that God places on mankind, you're starting in the wrong place. Jesus is the righteous one and he is our righteousness. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to all who believe. Secondly, we're going to look at Jesus as the sanctified one. We're all familiar with this term sanctification. We've just read in 1 Corinthians 1.30 that Christ has been made to us sanctification from God, the sanctified one. If you go to John chapter 17, John 17, verse 14, Jesus is praying here to the Father and he's praying about his disciples, his followers, and this can be applied to us as his new creations. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I don't ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I've sent them into the world. And for their sake, I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified in truth. So Jesus is praying here about being sanctified. What does that mean? Well, the clues are in the verses. Firstly, it means to not be of this world. We read in verse 14, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Same in verse 16, they're not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. It means to not be a part of this world's value system, of this world's philosophies, of the whole way that this world goes about doing things independently from God. Jesus is saying, I'm not of the world. And just like I'm not of the world, nor are they of the world. That's part of being sanctified, being holy. It also means being set apart for God. That's what the word consecration or sanctification means, to be set apart from God and Jesus set for God. And Jesus says this in verse 19, for their sake, I sanctify myself. In other words, Father, I set myself apart for you so that they also may be sanctified, set apart for you in truth. And then finally, it means to be sent into this world. Jesus said in verse 15, I don't ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. And then in verse 18, he says, as you sent me into the world, so I've sent them into the world. So we can look at this quality, if you like, of being holy, of being sanctified. And we can say that it means to be not of this world, not of this world's way of thinking and behaving and acting, but yet to be sent into this world, to be very much a part of the world, and all the while being set apart for God, that sanctification. And there's a wholeness when you live that way, set apart for God, not of this world's ways, but yet in the midst of the world, amongst the nations, that's holiness. There's a completeness to that way of living. And Jesus is saying here to the Father, this is who I am. I'm sanctified. I'm actually sanctifying myself, setting myself apart, that's who I am, Father. And because they're identified with me, because my believers are identified with me, that's who they are as well. Once again, our sanctification comes from Jesus. He's the one who's sanctified. So you'll have believers, and maybe you can identify this, who are constantly thinking about, well, how can I, how can I be holy? How can I make myself holy? Well, you don't start with yourself. You start with Jesus. He's the sanctified one. He has been made unto us sanctification. The moment you realize Jesus Christ is morally perfect, he is sanctified, he is set apart for God, 
He is not of this world and I'm in him and he's in me. The moment you realize that and by faith, you receive the fact that this is you too because you're in him and he's in you. Then you're gonna walk and live in that way, identity. He's, he's the righteous one. He's our righteousness. He's the sanctified one. He's our sanctification. You may be thinking, wow, this is heavy. This is complex. This is, you know, um, precise and a little bit laborious. If you want to build a building, you better take time over the foundations. You better make sure that they're solid and they're right. So it's important to realize Jesus is our foundation. He's our righteousness. He's our sanctification. He's also the redeemer and our redemption. Let's look at that. Ephesians chapter one, verse seven. Ephesians one, verse seven. What does it mean to be a re to redeem something? It means to buy it back. If you uh, are short of money and you have a TV or a watch hanging around the house and you're really desperate, then you can take it to a, a, an exchange shop, whatever they're called. And you, what's it called? A pawnbroker, pawn yeah. Take it there, give it to them. They'll give you some money. You go away, you can spend the money. And then you really want that watch back. You can go and buy it back if someone else hasn't bought it. You'll have to pay a bit more than you got it for, I think, or that you, they gave you for it, but you're redeeming that watch. You're buying it back. And we've been redeemed by Jesus. He is the redeemer. Ephesians 1, 7. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. He has bought us back from sin and from guilt through his blood. He's the redeemer. And he paid to redeem us, to buy us back from sin, from guilt. He paid with his blood. The next time the devil comes to you and you're a believer and he's dangling your failures in front of your face, you remind him that you were purchased with blood, that you've been bought back that your sin and your guilt has been forgiven and washed away by the blood of Jesus. And if you've been redeemed, what does that make you now? It, me it makes you someone's possession. He's the one who possesses us. He owns us. He bought us, the Redeemer, and he's our redemption. It's all in him, in Jesus. He didn't only buy us back, though, from sin and from guilt. He also brought us back from the power of Satan. When I was preaching on the streets here last week, God really laid it on my heart to preach about the fact that there are people walking around who are very, very aware that the devil exists, that there are forces of darkness playing with their lives. And God laid it on my heart to preach about the fact that Jesus doesn't only rescue us from our guilt, from our sin, doesn't only give forgiveness, but he sets us free and redeems us and breaks the power of the forces of darkness in our lives. Let's look at that. Um, Colossians chapter two. Actually, first let's go to Colossians one, verse 13. speaking about Jesus, the Redeemer. <clears throat> Colossians 1.13, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So right there you've got, it's being repeated that we've been redeemed from sin and guilt, our sins have been forgiven, that we now have been transferred from the kingdom of Satan, the kingdom of darkness, to the kingdom of God's beloved son, Jesus. In other words, we belong there. We belong with Jesus. We belong to Jesus. And then if we go over to chapter two, verse 15, 
we see here that Jesus has redeemed us and brought us back from the power of Satan. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him or in the cross. He disarmed the demonic principalities and powers, Satan himself, he took away their power. Some translations say he despoiled, he took spoil from them, like the spoils of war. He took something from them. And what was that something? It was you, took it away from the power of Satan. And he made an open spectacle of Satan and the rulers and authorities triumphing over them in the cross. And it's probably worth just adding a footnote to that. How did Jesus do that? How did he rescue you from the power of Satan? Well, what was Satan's power over you? Satan's power over you was the fact that you were living in a way that was breaking God's law. You couldn't match up to God's holy standard. So there's sin and there's guilt and there's death. What did Jesus do? We're told in verse 14 that he canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Once again, God's law is perfect and holy and good. And it says, you as a human being are supposed to live this way. This is how you're supposed to satisfy God because he's perfectly holy and righteous. And that law is constantly pointing out to you the ways that you've failed, the ways you're not matching up. And Jesus canceled that thing. He nailed it to the cross. He fulfilled it in himself. He satisfied every demand God could ever make of mankind. He did it. God is satisfied with Jesus. Satan therefore has no power over you, no right, as it were, to hold you in guilt, to hold you in that shame, because Jesus has done away with that record of debt, with its legal demands. That's how he disarmed Satan. So Jesus is the righteous one. He's our righteousness. He's the sanctified one. He is our sanctification. He's the redeemer. He's our redemption. He's a lot of things, isn't he? Isn't he glorious? He's also the reconciler, the reconciler. What does it mean to reconcile? Well, if you have two people who are, have fallen out, they become enemies and then they're brought back together, not just putting up with each other, but as friends, then that's reconciliation. And Jesus is the reconciler. Let's look at that. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 19. Aren't you grateful for Paul, the things that Paul had to say? You know, Jesus came and he, he taught so much about the kingdom of God, and then he died for us and he rose again and he ascended to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit. And then God began to reveal to Paul all the riches of the implications of that and of what that tells us about Jesus and about ourselves. Thank God for Paul. Second Corinthians 5 verse 19. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. That's a very short, pithy, but powerful statement. There in Jesus, you have God and the world brought back together. Praise God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German pastor in the time of the Second World War, he said this, God and the world are enclosed in the name of Jesus. God and the world. God loves the world. He loves the creation he's made. He loves the people he's made. He loves the cosmos he's made. And there's this desperate separation that came about through sin. But in Jesus, God and the world are brought back together. Humanity and divinity together. And that's true of new creation as well. Christ in you, divinity, humanity, glory, amen. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Enemies, those who were enemies are brought back together as friends. We couldn't bridge that gap, could we? We were God's enemies. We weren't even looking for him. At least I wasn't, were you? We, maybe, maybe you were, some people I guess in some way are, I wasn't. We couldn't bridge that gap. But while we were still his enemies, 
Christ died for us. Amen. He's the reconciler. He is our reconciliation with God. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. The gap has gone. The gap between you and God has gone in Christ. Do you ever feel like there's a gap? Do you ever feel like there's a distance? Well, that's just our perception. Because the reality is that in Christ, God and you are reconciled. Identity. John Stott, I can't remember the exact words, but he he said that you've got to constantly remind yourself of these truths, of what God has done for you in Christ, of who Christ is, until they're so natural to you that, that your mind just naturally goes there. It's true. Praise him. That's why Paul, I think, restates these things time and time again. I don't know about you, though, but I don't get bored of them because they're not just bits of information. Every time I read that God and, God and man are reconciled and brought back together, it just makes my heart leap. No. Jesus is the righteous one, the sanctified one, the redeemer, the reconciler. He's also the resurrection and the life. The resurrection and the life. Jesus said that, didn't he? I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet will he live. I am the resurrection and the life. Let's look at the, the resurrection first, that Jesus is the resurrection. Well, to be the resurrection, you have to die first, don't you? If you're going to be resurrected, you've got to die. If you've got to be the resurrection, something of death has to be present in, in who you are, or at least you have to have gone through that. Romans chapter 6. Romans 6, verse 10. For the death that Jesus died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. You can also look at Romans 6, verse 4. We therefore were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So Jesus died and Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. He is the resurrection, but he's also your resurrection and my resurrection because you, just as Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. We too have been given newness of life. Just as Jesus died to sin once for all and now lives to God, so you must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. How? In Christ Jesus. He is the resurrection and in Christ Jesus, you are alive to God. You've been resurrected. Amen. He is the resurrection. He is your resurrection. Your old self is dead with him, in him, and you have been raised to a new life in him, with him. Praise God. Consider yourself that way. Think of yourself that way. Constantly remind yourself, I am dead to sin and I am alive to God in Christ Jesus. Oh, but I failed this morning. Maybe you did, but the reality is that this is still who you are, dead to sin, alive to God in Christ Jesus. Move from that place into offering yourself, your body, your members, your, your life to God, not to, to sin, but to God. And so he's the resurrection and he is the life. Christ is the life. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 4, speaking about Jesus. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. This isn't just physical life, it's divine, eternal, spiritual, incomprehensibly 
majestic life. In him was life. It's resurrection life. It's the kind of life that brings the dead back to life. In him was life. It's the very life that God lives by. The life that he's always lived by. It's God's life. In Jesus was life and the life was the light of men. Jesus is the life. And when you were born again, when you said yes to Jesus, that life was placed in you. As again, we're constantly preaching on the streets and saying to people, look, being a Christian is not about being given a new set of values or a new set of principles or ways to live. Yes, it includes all of those things. It's about being given a whole new life force. And it's that life force that you live by. And when you live by that life force, you find yourself living the way you should. You find the values are there, the principles are there. You're living in them. When we're born again, the life of God comes into us and mixes with who we are and makes a whole new creation. And we see this in verse 12 of John chapter one, to all who did receive him, to all who said yes to Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it, when a baby's born? There's mum and dad are both somehow wrapped up in that baby. There's really three people in that baby, mum, dad, and the baby itself. Elementary genetics. <laughs> um, also an interesting parallel with the Trinity, but we won't go there. Three life forces in one, in a, in a baby. It's amazing that the, the parenthood, the father, the, the, the life of the father is in that baby. And we see the same here, that those who are born of God become children of God. That means more than just being given a new name. Now you're a child of God. It means God's own nature has been put into you and become part of who you are. Christ in you, the hope of glory, divine and human altogether. I think we cheat ourselves so much as Christians of what it is to be a new creation when we don't recognize and acknowledge the life of God that lives in us. Really, we cheat God. <laughs> we, I said we cheat ourselves, we do, but we're not living for ourselves, are we? At least that's not what we're called to. There's so much, there's so much that God has done in us in placing the Holy Spirit within us. And uh, he wants us to walk in that. So Christ is the life and Christ is your life. That life was placed in you and it became your life. One final scripture on that, um, Colossians chapter three. <clears throat> Colossians three, verse three. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. When Christ, who is your life, appears, you will appear with him in glory. You might be talking to someone one day and they're talking about their spouse and they say, you know, she's my life or well, he's my life. And it means like I live for this person, like everything about them is just what I live for. She's my life. Like if I can't conceive or imagine of life without this person or that person, that we can mean that, can't we? And we say, this person is my life. Or some, some people might even say, well, Manchester United is my life, you know, or playing golf is my life. Meaning a goal that you have, something you spend your time on, something you're devoted to. But that's not really what this is saying here. Christ is your life. It doesn't just mean that he's your goal. It doesn't just mean that he's what you're living for or the thing you're most enamored with. Hopefully he's all of those. But it means he's actually your life. He's part of who you are now through the new creation, through the new birth. Christ is your life. He's the source of your life. We're a new species. We're a new species. 
divine and human, wrapped up in one. Praise God. So Jesus is the righteous one. He is our righteousness. He is the sanctified one. He is our sanctification. He is the redeemer. He is our redemption. He is the reconciler. He is our reconciliation. He is the resurrection. He is your resurrection. He is the life. He is your life. Jesus, Christ in you. He's all those things. He's all those things. We don't start with ourselves. We start with him. That's where the power is. That's where the glory is. That's where the rest is. That's where the life is. I want to say two more things um, this evening. The first one is to do with the nature of the new creation. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have gone. Everything has become new. We all know that scripture. Okay. But I want to illuminate, if you like, a little more precision on what that's speaking about. If you turn to Matthew chapter 9, Matthew 9, verse 17. Matthew 9, 17, neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins and so both are preserved. We're just going to focus on that last statement. New wine is put into fresh wineskins and so both are preserved. Now, Jesus isn't talking about wine here. He's speaking about something spiritual, something to do with life with God and what it looks like. And he's speaking about the new birth. And he's saying there's this new wine that gets put in. And it gets put into fresh wineskins. So the new wine would be the Holy Spirit, would be Jesus that comes to live in you when you're born again. And what would the fresh wineskin be? Well, that would be you. Christ in you, but it says fresh wineskins. Now, there are two words used here, one for new and one for fresh. Some translations use the word new for both statements. They say new wine is put into new wineskins, but it's more correct and accurate to say new wine is put into fresh wineskins. The word for new here has the feeling of something that has never been there before. And the word for fresh has the sense of something that's been refreshed and made new. So it was there already, but it's been refreshed. So the new wine that's put in, when you become a believer, when the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, that's never happened before to you. Utterly new, something totally new come into you. But you as a person, you were there already. And so you are renewed, you're refreshed. You're like a vessel that's been refreshed. So you're still you, but you're a new you. And it's important to understand that. There was something that was there already, and that was you. And God renews that so that it can then receive the, the thing that's coming in that wasn't there before, which is the Holy Spirit. So something is already there that's renewed, and something entirely new comes in. And this is what you are as a new creation. You're a human being. You were a human being before you were saved and you're a human being now, but you're a renewed human being, a refreshed one. You're a fresh wineskin. God didn't just get rid of everything you were. Why would he do that? He made you in his image. Yeah, but he's refreshed you. He's renewed you so that that new wine can come in. And tonight we've been looking at the new wine that's come in, Jesus and who he is to us. Christ in you. Look at the two sides of the equation. Christ in you, the hope of glory, divinity and humanity, glory. Tonight we focused on Christ. And I want us to just take a moment and in our hearts, just let that hit our heart. 
Look at everything we've looked at about Christ tonight, who he is, the righteousness, the life, the resurrection, etc. Where's the focus? It's on Jesus. That's where the focus has got to be. Always begin with Jesus. Always move forward with Jesus. Always go back to Jesus and who he is. That's the solid foundation. That's the focus. Christ in you. I want to finish up now by just going back to the scripture we read at the beginning, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4. Sorry, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ controls us, because we've concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. The love of Christ controls us. Oh, we haven't talked about the love of Christ tonight, have we? We've talked a lot about Jesus and who he is, but we haven't talked about his love. We're not going to either, but it's there. The love of God wrapped up and expressed and flowing in and through his son, Jesus. Have to leave it at that, I'm afraid. The love of Christ controls us. One died for all, therefore all have died. Praise God, the old is gone. That those who live, those who live, new things have come. Those who live, that's you, might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. When C.T. Studd said, you know, if Jesus was God and he died for me, then no sacrifice is too great for me to make for him. He was including sacrifices such as leaving England and going to Africa and laying his life down there. But he was including so much more in terms of sacrifice. That we would live not for ourselves, but for him. That we would sacrifice our self-effort, our self-reliance, our self-will, our self-ambition, our self. That it's not all about me. It's all about Jesus. It's not all up to me. Jesus has been made to me. Righteousness, sanctification, redemption, etc. Sacrificing myself, my self, not living for myself, but for him, that we would no longer live for ourselves, but for him. For him who for their sake died and was raised. See, Jesus went before us in this process. He gave everything for you and he gives everything for you.